Hello and welcome to a Rygate College Maths video focusing on the introduction to parametric equations. In this video we are going to look at what they are and why they are useful and then how to convert between parametric and Cartesian coordinates. So what are parametric equations? So they are used when an equation can't be written using only x's and y's. Something like this. Now this is a spiral and as you can imagine it's quite difficult to write in terms of x and y because they're changing at various rates and they're curving back on itself and in fact the Cartesian equation, so Cartesian is a key word here, which we'll come back to. Cartesian. The Cartesian equation looks something like this. Now if you type this into a graphing program you'll get a slightly different um, looking function, but it's part of the curve that I showed you before. This is really complicated. Inverse tan of y over x equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. That's not a nice equation. Now Cartesian basically just means our x, y coordinates. Okay, Named after René Descartes, the French philosopher, this is a way of describing equations. And it's the way you've used so far. However, a parametric equation is a different way to look at it. So what this does is this says for any coordinate x, y on a graph, we are going to write that in a different way. We're going to write it as some function of t and another function of t. So we introduce another parameter. Could be t, if we're using trigonometry sometimes we'll use theta, but really you can use any letter you like. Traditionally we'll use t. So Whereas with Cartesian we have one equation describing one curve, parametric we have two equations. Describing one curve. For this one, we have x equals t cos t and y equals t sine t. Now, I'll un I understand that this is not particularly simple, but this is a much easier form than this for playing around with. As you can possibly imagine, differentiating or integrating these functions is again much more simple than this mess, and that's why they're useful. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the basics of um, range and domain of a parametric equation and also how to convert between parametric and Cartesian equations. So we may well have an example like this. A curve is defined by the parametric equations t, uh, x equals t cubed and y equals t squared minus 1 find its Cartesian equation. Again, notice we have two equations for one curve. And that's really the first thing you've got to get your head around with parametrics is that concept. So, what do we need to do? Well, we're given parametric, we want its Cartesian. Cartesians have no t. 
So what we want to do is we want to substitute or rearrange to eliminate T in some way. So let's start looking at our equations. Now we have two options to find t. We've got a quadratic or a cubic. Now I'll let you decide for a moment which you think is going to be more appropriate and then I'll tell you what I would do. So hopefully you've made a decision. Um, I'm going to use the first equation x equals t cubed. Now, why do I want to do that? Well, if I start playing around with the y equation, I'm going to have to square root, which means I've got to worry about a plus or minus, which is a bit of a faff. Playing around with the cubic means I don't have to worry about that. So, I'm going to rearrange to get t is x to the third. Now I've decided to write it as x to the third instead of the cube root because that's going to make my final answer look a little nicer. It's not wrong to write this as t equals the cube root of x. It's just a bit of a mess. So now what we want to do is substitute this x equals t, uh, sorry, t equals x to the third into here. So we get y equals x to the third squared minus 1, which tells me that y equals x to the 2 over 3 minus 1. And that's my Cartesian equation. You don't necessarily have to have y in terms of x, but if you can, that's quite nice. So now we have another example find the Cartesian equation for the following parametric equations. This time we've got some trigonometry in there. Now this is going to add an additional complication. With the previous example, we rearranged to make t the subject of one of the equations, but that's not going to be particularly nice. For instance, if we do this, we get t is... Oops inverse cos of x, so therefore y equals cos of 2 r cos x. Now that is correct, but it's not useful in any stretch of the imagination. So what should we do instead? Well, we've got trig so we need to think about trig identities. So the correct way to look at this question is think about the trig identities. Is there a way to relate cos 2t to something involving t? And in this case, there absolutely is. Because we know that we can rewrite cos 2t as 2 cos squared t minus 1. We know that cos t is x, so cos squared t must be x squared. So this is in fact a relatively basic quadratic. So now we add a second part to this question, finding the range and domain. The important thing is that it's not necessarily just the standard range and domain of this function. So if we think about this function, just on its own with nothing else that we've done, the range is that x is any real number, and the domain, sorry, the domain is x is any real number, and the range is y is greater than or equal to minus 1. However, we had the restriction here at the top of the page. That we have restricted the value of t. Which means that both x and y have similarly restricted values. 
So let's think about the domain. So the domain is all to do with x. So we now have x equals cos t. If we think about this on its own, without anything around it, we can imagine, we can plot this graph, or we can sketch this graph, for t, for the x being the y-axis and t being the x-axis. I know that's confusing, but there we go. So if we draw this for t is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, we get this graph. So we want to look at what values of x come out. So the values of x for this set of values of t is anything between 0 and 1. So the domain of this function is x is between 0 and 1. And we can do the range in the same way. I mean, if you've got the domain here, you can work out the range from this, but let's do it from this. So we've got y equals cos 2t. So again, let's think about sketching the graph of cos 2t between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. This time, the y-axis is y, the x-axis is t. Notice how we've got x is cos t and y is cos t, so we change the y-axis. So, this one is the same as this graph, but squashed. So, we start at 0, that's pi over 4, and that's pi over 2. Cos is symmetrical, so it looks like that. Now, I know this is not a particularly big graph, but it doesn't need to be. So now we can look at the y coordinates that come out and we can see that this graph for these values of t outputs values of y between minus 1 and 1. So in general, if x is p of t and y is q of t, the range of the whole function is the range of y equals q of t, and the domain is the, is the range of x is p of t. And this is the thing that confuses a lot of people, is we're talking about range, but we've got x's. That's because it's the range of this little function Really, the letters here don't hugely matter, other than it's x, which means eventually it's going to give us the domain of the original function. So that's kind of an introduction to rearranging parametric equations into Cartesian equations. For this A-level spec, you don't have to go the other way, which is nice. You don't have to go from Cartesian to parametric. That gets a little confusing. So you can now go away and practice using the textbook. Thank you for listening.